Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Thank you for tuning in to this conversation with Kwame Samori Brathwaite. My name is Charlie Wiley. I'm the Curator of Photography and New Media at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And today we're going to focus on the work that the Santa Barbara Museum of Art has acquired by the photographer Kwame Brathwaite. And we're gonna structure this as a conversation. Uh, if there's time at the end, we would like to take some questions, certainly. We have a lot of ground to cover um, and it's marvelous ground. Uh, so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? Oh, Kwame, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want to say something? <laughs> no worries. No, I, I thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, you know, Santa Barbara Museum of Art for uh, having me this morning. I, it's, a, it's always a great opportunity to talk about the work and, and, and the legacy, but also just in having an opportunity to talk to you, uh, you know, officially. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Probably an audience. I think, um, you know, we've been talking for some time now and, and really appreciate uh, the interest in the work. I, I, I always I always love when people are impacted by it. And so uh, any opportunity to talk through it is, is phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you. I was so eager to get in. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just put the first slide up, please. And this just, um, Elena. I think it's coming. There we go. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Oh, and mine needs, uh, there we go. Great. So here we are. Yes. Um, I wanted to, uh, um, I wanted to um, mention that the talk has been sponsored by Photo Futures. And Photo Futures is our group of photography enthusiasts uh, that was formed. Uh, uh, almost 25 years ago, and they have been instrumental in acquiring works for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, Santa Barbara Museum of Art's photo photography collection. And there is a direct connection to the work of Kwame Brathwaite um, in that. Uh, next slide, please. They acquired this photograph uh, in 19, or 2018 in an annual uh, event called the buying spree and they vote on works of art to acquire with their funds and this was uh, acquired with their funds. This is the work that really grabbed me from the start. Uh, I think I went to the Philip Martin Gallery to look at a range of things and I saw this and just seized on it. It's one of those moments in a curator's life that you just know uh, that you must have this work of art in the collection. And I'll talk more about it, why I want it, and I'm going to ask Kwame to talk more about it as well. But I think you can tell the immediacy of it, the, um, the range of um, the gesture in that he's both holding the camera and then also gesturing to you as a viewer. Uh, and then there's this back and forth. Are you the subject that is being portrayed? Is he talking to you as a, uh, you know, model or a sitter or, a, you know, what have you? And this idea that he's just about to start a conversation is something that I rarely found in a photograph and it just, uh, a self-portrait even. And so this was the thing that it was just, you know, rock solid. I knew that I was going to have to have this for the collection. And so this was our first acquisition and it was made possible by Photo Futures. Next slide, please. So Kwame Rathwaite, just to give you some facts, born in 1938, lives and works in New York. That's a standard curatorial facts about an artist's life. Next slide, please. And to get more facts about his life, um, I urge you to go to uh, kwamebrathwaite.com, which is an extensive website, which has quite a number of articles on it, uh, on the career and the life and the show. And Kwame S. Brathwaite um, is, a uh, presence in many of these. And so one of the reasons that I'm focusing on the works of art that we're going to be discussing is that these are the works of art that we as a museum have acquired and there will be eight of them and that we've acquired in the past um, uh, two years. And so for 
the wonderful story about Coyne Brathwaite and his life and art and what's going on now and what is going on in the future, I urge you to uh, go to KwameBrathwaite.com, this website that is quite wonderful to, for even more background. Next slide, please. This is the catalog that uh, is, uh, was produced by Aperture for an exhibition that I saw with my colleague, Fabian Leva Baragan in, um, at the Skirball. And absolutely magnificent exhibition, but also a wonderful book. And I reread it last night and it was an absolute pleasure uh, because it encompasses the life in a way that is uh, almost reads like a novel. Uh, and it has such, uh, as Kwame, we were talking beforehand, it, it, it has, it's so beautifully written that it engages you in a way and it's so informative uh, that the information is presented in an extremely wonderful way. And the authors are Colin Brathwaite himself, Tanisha Ford and Deborah Willis. And Tanisha Ford and Deborah Willis are wonderful, uh, distinguished scholars of African-American photography. Um, and their bios are uh, legion. And so I, in, uh, I hope you will be able to investigate their work as well. But uh, this book is available by Aperture, I should also say, and I'll give that information at the end of the talk, but it, I should also say that it's uh, for those who live in Santa Barbara or the region, it's also on sale in our bookstore as well. And the next slide, please. And this gives you the information of the website, how to order it and the uh, citation of the book that you, where you see it with a marvelous cover that is behind Kwame. Did you want to, we were just talking about this cover. Do you want to talk about the cover a little bit? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it was it was interesting because when we were looking to do my father's first book uh, and having a, a partner like Aperture really support and, and the vision that we had, you know, there were really two, it's funny you, you touched upon them already, the two images that we really contemplated were either the self-portrait or this image um, of my mother, actually, Sokolo Brathwaite. And so one of the things that I think was important for us was to tell the story, but to tell the story uh, and represent, you know, what was important to him, uh, what is important to him uh, as his, you know, his muse. Uh, and, but also to to kind of have this really engaging cover that that gives you a tease, right? What what, what am I about to read? Uh, I think it was really beautiful, and and I, I love the fact that Abbott just supported that thought of not necessarily putting words across this image to take away from it. So the so the the person who's contemplating whether or not they want to you know delve into this book can can really just take in the image and. It's one of my favorite images uh, from his work, along with self-portrait. There, there are a few that really kind of jumped out for us, and and it was one of the primary images that we put out, the first color portraits that we put out. And so it was really important for us to kind of make sure that uh, one, uh, the family was represented, my mother was represented, and and his work uh, was the story was told, and and even to tag onto that, I mean, just just the story about connecting with Tanisha. Uh, Ford uh, was was one of you know serendipity and, and and just kind of good fortune. She had already written a book, uh, which is a liberated threads that's up on that bookshelf behind me. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I found her because I was writing an article to um, talk about the work, and and her book popped up and many excerpts. And so she had already done research about the Grandassa models, about the work that Ajaz had done. And so it was really uh, great when I reached out to her. She'd been looking to contact my father, but wasn't able to. And so um, it was a, it was an incredible experience. And she's now become kind of extended family uh, for us uh, and wrote the article for Aperture, wrote the book, uh, the first three chapters of the book. And then longtime friend and colleague, Deb Willis, um, who is an incredible artist herself, as well as a scholar and really kind of set the tone for helping people understand what was going on during that time. So it was, it was really just an honor to be able to work with both of them uh, to make sure that uh, the work was represented properly. And it, it's important to, um, to uh, 
you know, um, talk about how you yourself were involved very much in this project. Yeah, you know, it, it's, um, it was, it was, it was kind of the brainchild of my father always wanted to, to publish a book and he wanted to put, put out his first monograph. And when we found Aperture through Philip Martin Gallery, uh, who's the gallery that represents us, uh, Philip had an, a relationship <clears throat> with Michael Famagetti at Aperture and sent over essentially contact sheets. And Michael immediately uh, found the, the artistic value, but fell in love with the work and the conversation started. And, and I think for me, being able to help facilitate that, um, and this was really my my test for my father, <laughs> you know, he went to self-publish and I said, look, I think we can work with this group. They are, they are true uh, photography um, at its core and they'll represent the story properly. And um, it was it was just an incredible experience working with them. And that's how the tour was born, um, you know, the, the traveling tour. Uh, it's really an extension of this book. Um, the, uh, okay, next slide, please. So um, I'm not sure. Well, I'll just, I'll just uh, continue on. So the, the, uh, idea of this talk, as I said, is to focus on the work that we have in the collection that we have acquired. And I'm doing it chronologically, not by date of acquisition, but by, um, oh, there you are. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I was saying that uh, the talk, we're gonna go through and talk about the images that we have acquired, um, not by date of acquisition, but by chronology of the works themselves. And in the book, um, the role of jazz is central to the formation of uh, your father and his brother. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, um, the thing that was incredible about what, you know, and, and, and just to set the, set the record straight, I, I think oftentimes people um, confuse the, the kind of story about how this all came about. And I think what's really critical is understanding that this was, you know, my father was the was the image maker of the group um, from the photography standpoint, making sure that this, this work was documented. Um, but at the core of it, it was, you know, uh, this group Ajaz, uh, who was formed by Alambi Breath, my uh, uncle, my father, uh, and a number of other creators. Um, and they, come together, Bob Gums, uh, Frank Adieu, Chris Hall, Ernest Baxter, um, all came together um, along with others to form this group that really wanted to represent the, the music of their time. Uh, they were all creators, had come out of a school, um, School of Industrial Arts, which essentially um, set them in this role of, um, you know, creating together but also looking to see how can we make an impact? And so they started with essentially jazz concerts, right? They started putting on jazz concerts with musicians of that time. They were 18 to 19 years old, which is still mind boggling to me because you know they were so, they were so young and kind of figured that out. Uh, they wanted to represent the music of their time and it was it was revolutionary music, right? It was, it was a, an art form created by us. And, and so they wanted to represent it uh, and even in 1956, when, when they formed a jazz, they were calling themselves the African Jazz Art Society, which one was a, you know, a revolutionary act in itself and that they uh, were calling themselves African in a time where people were still calling themselves Negro. And so it was this, um, this desire to one, create their own lane um, and represent the music that they felt was, you know, near and dear to their hearts, but also it was a way for them to kind of put out their ideology um, as Africans who are displaced uh, within the diaspora, um, who wanted to represent uh, something that was truly created by um, African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what uh, the reason that I was so 
you know, drawn to this image is that the first image of the self-portrait that we acquired was this marvelous idea of a single figure and then here is a group. And they're all looking at him in various uh, poses and various attitudes, but they're all kind of riveted on him uh, as the photographer. And this also speaks of, you know, the club atmosphere uh, where they were so active. And one of the great uh, one of the one of the great things is that um, his group of friends were too young to actually um, uh, sign up or to create a a place where liquor was sold, and so they had a friend who was over twenty one, a court stenographer, uh, who was a professional, you know, uh, and uh, she was able to do all the paperwork and get this this done for them and sign for right, them. Right. And that's what you were talking about in terms of this marvelous energy at such an early age. I mean, just really tremendous. Uh, like they themselves couldn't even go in and, and buy a drink, but they were creating <laughs> right. the milieu, <laughs> right, right. which I think is fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> you also notice that all of these works are in a square format. And um, this is a... Uh, convention of photography of the Hasselblad uh, camera and how he was able to, you know, find this um, and, and work with it is another really wonderful uh, tale in the, in the narrative that Tanisha Ford tells as well. So um, the next slide, please. This is one that I saw at the uh, Skirball and was just, you know, I felt like I was melting into the image itself. Um, and what I love about it is that it's not taken from the front, it's from the back. And so he was behind the musicians at this time. And um, the way that you yourself are kind of feeling part of what is going on is, I think, extraordinary. Um, can you Can you talk a little bit more about you know, what, what his experience in jazz clubs was and, and how that got started? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, it really started from them really doing these shows, right? Club 845 was one of the first um, venues that they used um, to put on these jazz concerts. Um, but it's also, you know, if you look back at, at kind of the juxtaposition of the two images, and you look at one, this photo of, you know, these these patrons in the club who are aware of his presence and, and consciously, you know, understanding that he's there. But I think the thing that's really amazing about the way in which and he and, and many photographers are able to kind of get in, be a part of the scene, but not take away from it, not um, steal the the moment uh, in and of itself. And I think you, you look at these different perspectives, right? And so you have, you know, one perspective where he's, you know, taking pictures of the pages in the club, and then this perspective where he's still, you know, from behind with the musicians. Uh, in all of it, there's this there's this level of comfort Right. There's this level of being able to be yourself, um, being able to be uh, comfortable in this space. And and I think it, it kind of taps into uh, these these ideas of of people being able to to just be themselves. Right. And to bring their entire selves to whatever they're doing. Right. It was part of the, the Black is Beautiful movement and core principle and being able to embrace who you are and just and just be. Right, mm -hmm. and I think um, oftentimes when you look at uh, f photographers as image makers, um, they are allowing you, as the viewer, to just be. And hopefully, what they do is they capture the the place and they capture the the feeling uh, that's happening. And I think he does this so well. Uh, the way he navigates being inside of these different areas with people. Understanding that he's there, but just saying, okay, he's there and then continuing to do what they're doing in this in this space and being comfortable and, and still thriving and, and being able to to communicate what they what they'd like to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and you know, because they love jazz so much, you know, the, clearly that comes out in the work as well. 
And uh, there's also uh, what Tanisha Ford talks about is the idea of he didn't take thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs. He actually waited for the right moment. And so something like this is clearly the right moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, that he was able to just kind of sit back. And I think this is what you're talking about, this kind of just comfort of being where you are, who you are in that milieu and in that moment and just kind of waiting for the right, you know, time to time to take the picture. Yeah. I mean, understanding, understanding the form, understanding music form, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, if you take it to what happens now, it's like, you know, when the the guitar solo is coming or the the B drop is coming or the person does that incredible rap solo or the the R and B musician that like, kind of goes into their their you know their ebb and flow. It's 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 understanding the music form, um, but also understanding the tone of what's happening and how the crowd is responding and how those musicians are going into some sort of improvisation, where, whether it be jazz or whatever. But having a, a true understanding of the music form uh, enables you to do that, and that's and that's what they were. They they were first jazz enthusiasts, um, <clears throat> who then turned it into something where they share their love with other people, and and then he then communicated that through his work. Well, it's it's also interesting in terms of how um, the uh, his background, you know, he went to high school to um as as uh draw for based on drawing and you know so that that sense of picture making uh clearly yes. was part of it from from the beginning and even if i'm recalling this correctly you know uh he but then he went into advertising and that's something that i i want to talk about later on uh based on the idea of the emergence of visual culture in you know the post-war era sure. the next slide please there's so much to talk about I mean, it's just <laughs> this is so great so this is another instance i think of you know what we were just talking about um and what i loved about this is obviously a portrait of a great artist um listening to playback um and there's a whole story about how they were able to um hire great musicians for their clubs um and uh but <clears throat> what i loved about this is that uh this sense of listening and um you know both silence and sound uh how he captures this idea of of cannonball adderley listening to himself perform and what does that mean uh you know what's he thinking about an artist assessing his art um and you know the figure in the background is also in this kind of silent mode where they're concentrating on what is you know happening and so if any kind of image can you know kind of embody the idea of sound i think it's it's this and and yet we have to imagine it for ourselves and it's also, you know, the central placement. Um, formally, it's such a such a beautiful photograph, but also psychologically, you know, he's he's like, well, you know, what have I, what 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 am, what am I doing? What can I improve? What you know, how good is this? How you know, what what do you think about this image? Yeah, it's 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 an incredible, and it's in and it's um, you know, it's it's actually the National Portrait Gallery, uh, and and I think it's for me, I think you you captured the essence of it and I think the thing, the thing that was also appealing to me is that you know even the way he's sitting on the chair right he, he flipped the chair around you know you only do that when you're really kind of getting like you're getting down to business right typically you sit on the chair the proper way he flipped it around he's 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 really getting into this work right he's he's assessing you know did we as musicians capture and and and, and tell the story that we wanted to tell right um and I think this playback and and this pensive kind of thought processes, you know, we don't know, did, did, did he capture it, right? Did, is, is he, you know, artists are their own biggest critics. And so when you, when you see Cannonball assessing and, and, and trying to figure out, did we do what we set out to do? Uh, it, it's, 
it's really incredible to see it and it, and it makes you wonder right what what happened right after this mm -hmm. um in in the in the group of photos that we're taking during the session you see them playing and you see them doing other things but this was the one where they were they were they were in that space right they're in that space of um thought of of contemplating you know their art form in its purest form and so i thought uh it, it's always been a, an incredibly appealing image for me and i and i was i was delighted at the fact that that this was one of the ones that the museum had acquired well it 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 makes a nice trio um surrounding jazz and uh so that was a <clears throat> that was certainly part of part of the reasoning but um you know i probably would have just gotten this you know completely otherwise too uh so um i also wanted to bring up um that he did work in color as well um but uh what we and uh, what the early part of the work that we have collected is in black and white and um he mentions that you know the black and white really was this kind of wonderful medium for him to work in that he instinctually was drawn to i mean it's timely um, it's timely yeah. you know this un unless you unless you look at kind of stylistic things uh for the most part you know the guy in back you know he's got the high-waisted pant uh almost almost like a capri but it but it's it's interesting because unless you understand kind of the the the, the nature of dress this photo could have happened in 2020 Right. It's just it's that's that's the thing that I think about black and white that is oftentimes gives this um, this timeless feel to it. And I and yeah, he did. He worked in both mediums, but he he, he certainly had uh, an affinity for for black and white, especially. Yeah. Early. And we'll see color in, in a bit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next slide, please. So I kind of gave away my. Um, <laughs> take on why I love this image so much. Uh, and when you see it in person, it really is this invitation to a discussion. Um, and we were at the gallery and I had not seen other variations, variants of this image. And I was just absolutely entranced uh, by how this came about. Can you talk about you know, the other images in this series? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because he, he he plays around with, you know, background, he plays around with lighting, he plays around with, you know, what he's wearing. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, it was, you know, ultimately what he was doing was he was trying to um, put an image out that that invited you to, you know, what exactly what you talked about, invited to him uh, as this image maker, right? Are you, are you the subject? I'm the subject now, but you will be the subject um when we engage right and so what that experience is like in, in that conversation uh but interestingly enough uh one of the ways in which he used this particular flower because you don't see a lot of images he didn't take a lot of images of himself you know he's often behind the camera you know making images of other people uh and he uh ended up using an image it's a variant of this image on a flyer for advertising his photography work and advertising the fact that he was available for uh, portraits and photo shoots. And so uh, it, it really was this, uh, what, what's the best image that, that I can put forth that invites people to be comfortable with, with that experience? Because, you know, that, that's a very intimate experience, right? Enabling someone to, one, relax, um, because oftentimes these people are either, you know, professional models sometimes, but oftentimes they're not. Uh, how how can one be most comfortable in that space where you're revealing parts of yourself, sometimes emotionally, um, but also physically of who you are as a person? And so having, you know, this very uh, handsome, calming person on the other side um, is something something uh to be uh to be admired and i think you know the fact that he's wearing a, a suit which he kind of always wore a suit um is this you know this professional uh this professional experience that you're going to have mm -hmm. and picking up on what you said before about 
you know, an image being taken then, but, you know, also being seeming of today. One of the, one of the main things that I really love about the work is that it's not nostalgic. Um, even though, of course, it comes from a certain place in time, there isn't, there is not a, you can't compartmentalize it into like, oh, well, that was then. Right. Um, there's an immediacy to the work that, that where nostalgia has no place, uh, which um, I think is really, uh, you know, so consistent throughout the work and, and, and a, a real, a real um, reason I think that <clears throat> I keep coming back to it because I love that idea of the consistency of images and how they can continue to be relevant uh, and not from even an historical point of view and from an immediate point of view of today sure. of how this image right now interacts with us as viewers. Uh, so as I said, this was the first one we got and was made possible by our great photo futures group. So the next slide, please. So um, one of the things that, that you say, you know, the, the foundation is involved with is um, the, uh, uh, you manage the father's photographic archive and collaborative projects that are concordant with the themes in his father's work, namely activism, politics, fashion, and music. So this is where the politics comes in. And I wanted to represent this. Um, this is a Garvey Day Parade you know, we had the group uh, photograph that we first saw, and then I was taken with this um, chronologically. Um, this was this summer. And so um, this was the first group photograph that we acquired. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that consistency of um, uh, being able to know the right moment to capture, you know, these people. Uh, can you explain what's going on here a little bit? Yeah, so this is um, this is actually during one of the um, the talks. Oftentimes, people would uh, stop and talk to you know groups outside, uh, and you know this is a a group of people watching one of the street speakers uh, kind of talk through, you know, educating them on what's happening in the world. Um, I I think it's the thing that really um, appeals is that this woman is holding a New York Times <clears throat> magazine. It's folded up in her hand. So she's, you know, she's clearly, um, you know, one who wants to be educated. The, the man with the hat on just two over with the glasses facing to the left. Um, he has he has a piece of paper in his hand. So there's there's information being provided. But I but it's also it also reminds me of of this um, this thing that my, my uncle Lambi would always say is like always have always have a book or a newspaper or something with you because you need to be educated about what's going on around you in your life and, and what's going on in the world. And so she has this New York Times, which is probably a totally different set of um, different information that you're gonna get than you're getting from these street speakers, right? And so mm -hmm. New York Times is telling what's happening in the world that um, the world that uh, is, is, is a very Eurocentric one um, and this is the one that's the, this, the speaker that's speaking to you is talking about what's happening, um, throughout the diaspora as, as an African, uh, um, in, in, in an ancestor of African descent. And so I think it's this really amazing, um, conversation that's being had where you're uh -huh. getting information from two different, two different places and she's assessing, you know, where that falls in her life, uh, so I thought that was really amazing. It's also this woman where she's, you know, she's surrounded by all these men. They're all focused on, well, with the exception of the other two who seem to be looking at something happening to the left, but they're focused on this very specific um, message that's being that's being um, taught. Uh, and she's she's the center figure. She's the power. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the dynamic that also plays out through much of his photography, where. Um, these powerful, educated, active women making decisions for their, their own lives are present throughout the work. And so um, it's a really fun thing. And, and also, as we go through this project and go through the archive, uh, one of the great things that happens is that you have 
people sometimes reach out and identify people that you may, may not have been able to identify before. Uh, and this woman's name is Olive Peeker. Um, and she is, um, she's now deceased, but her, her cousin actually reached out and sent some images and, and identified her and said, wow, that's so amazing. <laughs> this is, uh, this image is here. And so, and it was actually through a New York Times article that she saw it. So it was really um, kind of a full circle, right? She's holding the New York Times magazine. It's in the New York Times oh. article. She sees it and I'm able to identify more of the work. So it's really, um, it's, 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 a, it's an incredible image, but I think the power um, the intelligence, the the kind of um, the thought process of, of of having these this conversation between the two pieces of information is really critical. That's yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's very. I I had obviously noticed the Times Magazine section, but um, that's a wonderful way to you know uh, connect its iconography, as we say in art history. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, next slide, please. And then this is kind of, you know, the reason I wanted to get this is that uh, it wasn't the person that they were listening to, but it is an example of, you know, politics in action. Um, the uh, Charles Speaker, Street Speaker, head of ANMPM, which is the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement, uh, which was headed up by Carlos Cooks, which was um, a um, uh, an organization very much centered on the ideas of Marcus Garvey and the early 20th century, uh, you know, Pan-Africanist, um, buy black, uh, think black, act black, uh, the idea of self-reliance and self-determination and to not follow the European model, but to look to Africa for you know, a cultural inspiration um, and to celebrate that, to celebrate one's, you know, heritage. Um, and so what I would love to hear what he is saying, of course, um, but the sign uh, is something that I think, you know, obviously talks about why what he is talking about. And this phrase in and of itself is one that, um, you know, was, was part of this dialogue. Uh, but again, in terms of the, you know, idea of him being able to compose a photograph, so many of the other ones to me were so kind of classically balanced in a way, and this one's not. Uh, right. It's taken at an angle. Um, there are angles throughout. Uh, and there's a much different energy going on here. In the previous one, it's it's very kind of balanced um, and formal in a way. And this one has much more a sense of, of energy, but also, you know, you, that he is standing bes behind uh, and and watching. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know this this photograph? Yeah, you know, it's it's it is. I think you captured it in the in the in the. The difference in the previous photograph and this energy, right? Um, he's he's speaking, he's speaking, and he's he's not quiet. He's not speaking softly. Um, he's he's communicating a message to a group of people, right? And so that's you know one twenty fifth and Adam Clayton Powell's Boulevard. That that is you know the place where people would go to hear street speakers like Carlos Carlos Speaker as well as Malcolm X and others, and 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 so it. It was this place where people knew to go to get information, um, but I also think you, you captured that as well. The, this balance of, you know, the juxtaposition of you know him and his hat, along with the, you know, the the juxtaposition of the the by black that's coming off. Then there's the other side about parking, and 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 then he also captures. Um, the spirit of the place, right? You see the the kind of two five of 125th Street. You you understand where this um, historically sits um, on that iconic street, on that iconic place, um, and um, and it's this this uh, this notion of you know community building, right? And so uh, the whole the whole premise of buy black, think black, uh, is this understanding that you do not have to go and do things um, outside of that that community that you're in you know 
you also have to think about the time when it wasn't necessarily safe to go down below a certain street, the, the Upper East Side, right? 96 or below, or, or, or people typically were in their neighborhood. And so you didn't have to go downtown to buy a dress or do whatever you need to do. You could stay within your own community and, and buy black. Um, my grandfather, uh, my father's father, um, you know, owned two dry cleaners and tailor shops uh, in Harlem and was able to become this immigrant from Barbados who um, became an entrepreneur and was able to support their family. You know, they, so it was this, this notion that you could do that and be within your own community. And it's a powerful message that still resonates today. And it's happening now as we go through um, kind of what's happening in the world right now, when it, whether it be Black Lives Matter or also supporting Black businesses, I think um, that became a thing, right? Um, it was it was a popular hashtag for a while, uh, but I think what people understand is that it does resonate. It you you have to support the people who are creators, the people who are whether that be purchasing goods, whether it be using services, whether it be you know connecting with people um, uh, and and collaborating on projects. It's it's part of this entire sense of community and, and it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an African, you know, kind of concept of this tribe being this, this supportive group of, of each other and working through ways in which we support each other to community build and build ourselves up. And so this, um, this image, one, bec obviously because of the statement that's being made, but also because of the fire and, and, and the, um, the magnitude of what uh, he is likely saying uh, it is it is one of the one of the more powerful images I think in in the group. Yeah, this this was another one that you know to to have uh, you know someone listening and then someone speaking. It it made sense to have you know them as a pair, and uh, you know to bring the politics of. Uh, you know, the day of Marcus Garvey of, of Buy Black, I think that was important as well to represent in this body of work. The next slide, please. And then this, the last two that we're going to talk about are the third and fourth. Um, and uh, uh, things, or uh, was it the second and third? I keep, I, uh, we have eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, these were the second and third uh, images that we bought. Um, and this is uh, Scola Brathwaite at AJS Studios, and uh, AJS was uh, African Jazz Art Society, and then studio was added uh, after that. Can you, to begin talking about this, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when you know, studio, has, studio came in. Um, yeah, they when when they acquired the studio, when they, you know, the studio was at 243 West 125th Street, it was just a few doors down from the Apollo Theater. Uh, when they uh, opened the studio, uh, that was when they essentially created that connection to one, that iconic street of 125th Street, but also enabled them to kind of set up shop and really start to do the work that they were looking to do, whether that be through education, um, um, working with other organizations, um, December 12th movement, um, uh, my my uncle uh, was the head of the Patrice Lumumba Coalition, um, pulling these organizations together to work on items, whether it be shows that they were doing, the naturally shows um, featuring you know the Grand Aston models and, and keeping the 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 idea of um, Black is beautiful and pr promoting that idea, to um, creating content, whether it be books or articles or um, Different things that they were putting out into the world as as these creators, uh, it was it was there. It became that base. Uh, it became the place where people came to meet. It became the place where my father could often uh, photograph uh, and and shoot at the um, at the studio. But it also it, it became the hub. It became that creative space um, that they had, and they had it for many many years, uh, so that they could do the work that Ajaz was set out to do. And um, uh, can you talk about the model in, uh, that we're looking at? 
Yeah, um, familiar. Um, my, that's that's my mother, Sakola Brathwaite. Uh, this is uh, 1968, and and you know, again, uh, you know, there are there are thousands and thousands of people that my father photographed and did amazing work with. I think this one resonated uh, as one of the color portrait images uh, for us. Uh, there's this. Um, the, the combination of the background with the, the dress, but also the this kind of regal pose. Oftentimes you see in the work, um, you know, you see images of women, people smiling in the work, but mostly you see these images where um, there's, a, there's, a, there's very much a focus on capturing uh, that natural kind of, that natural, uh, beauty, but also, they, you know, they're, they're not changing their attitude or their emotion uh, and, and putting that out there. It, it is, it is, this is, this is what you, this is what you get. But I think in, in the way he's making these images, he's ensuring that you are getting the best possible version of this, of this person, this, there, there's a regalness in, in her, in her posture in the way that she's looking. She's not looking directly at the camera. It's not quite a profile. Um, the fact that you now have, you know, the the natural hairstyle, which is obviously the, the core theme of the naturally um, shows that they've been putting on. But also, um, you know, I, I, I posted this on Instagram at one point in time and someone, actually this, this um, Brazilian woman was like, this is, the perfect image of the Black Madonna, right? And so it was this really um, incredible uh, interpretation of what she saw in this image and, and what she's um, viewing. But I think what he is enables the viewer to do is to to allow you to kind of just sit and, and, and experience the image. Uh, I think the, the other thing that's really amazing for me is being able to uh, put these out at the scale that we can create them in, right? And so um, he was limited by his technology to some extent, but the images in, in this image at the museum that you have at, you know, this 30 by 30 size is a really, um, you feel the presence of the work uh, and you you get to kind of sit and really, or, or stand and really just ex experience it. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I clearly like uh, images that represent uh, his work and his art, his artistry. But I also like the fact that you know you have um, this group, you right? The, these these models that were together, um, who really were about living this lifestyle, um, mm -hmm. who were about um, creative uh, community uh, together. Uh, it, it's it's just incredible, and so you know, there's images of my aunt Numsa, there's images of Black Rose and Clara Bugs, and and you know, all these different models who were part of the group, um, and so it's really uh, it's really amazing to be able to put some of these images out. But this green, you know, against the 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 really bright pink, and it it was just one of these um, incredible uh, pieces that that I think had to be put out. Yeah, and and we thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the Naturally shows uh, in Naturally 62, and that was an extremely important manifestation of everything that was going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, the first show was January 28, 1962. It was, it was the first time really that you um, had models or, and, and I, I think, you know, not to, not to um, discredit what modeling is, but I think these were women in the community who were activists, they were thought leaders, they were communicators, they were, um, they, they had come together and they embraced, they just happened to be beautiful women who embraced the um, idea that you did not have to um, aspire to a, a, a beauty standard that wasn't your own. Right, you could you could embrace your nat natural African heritage, and be beautiful in your natural state. And so, um, that was the first time that this idea had been put out into the community. Um, and that first show um, was so popular, even though it it it, it got some um, 
you know, there was some pushback against having models not press their hair, um, wearing African uh, attire uh, on on this during this show on this runway. Um, despite that, that pushback, there were so many people at the first show that they had to clean up quickly and do another show. There's so many people waiting outside. So it was really something um, when you look at what that community uh, was missing, uh, but also understanding that um, that it was something that was needed, right? Uh, and I think, you know, you have to credit um, Ajaz and the Grandasa models for understanding what the, what the time called for and what, um, you know, what that messaging was, which, um, you know, which was a really powerful one in that, you know, embrace who you are, um, you know, black is beautiful, just the way, just the way you are, so. And also when we talked about this <clears throat> at the gallery, you mentioned how women were essential to everything that was going on. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's really this, um, you know, you're talking about a time when in 1956, you know, it, women and men weren't necessarily being placed on the same level playing field and it's still not the case even today. And I think when you think about the fact that um, it was Ajaz, it was the Grand Assa models together, talking through planning shows, you know, when you really think about it, and I was, it's funny, I was talking to my mother about this and how revolutionary this concept is, these models were creating the fashions themselves. It wasn't like someone was going and dressing them. Mm -hmm. Now, there were instances where a designer who would design something specific and custom to them um, that was made specifically for them, but it represented, you know, this African standard, but oftentimes they were sewing their own clothes um, or they were getting people in the community to help them they would design them and, and they would sew it clothes. So the agency that they had as um, one creatives, but also in what the visual representation of this entire structure of, of uh, communication about naturally shows and being black, black and beautiful, that was from them uh, in a time when oftentimes that voice was not, when it was not able to be heard. So it is, um, it was, it was an amazing thing to discover that. And it was funny because, you know, during even during the book writing, Tanisha got together with a few models, um, a few grand ass models who um, then spoke to her and rightfully so, she kicked me and my father out of the out of the room and took it away <laughs> so that she could have a real conversation about what that was, um, about what the, what the camaraderie was, what the experience was. And it was, it was an incredible experience because that's what they did. They were on even playing field. It's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a wonderful uh, facet of this entire movement, which, you know, when you, when you delve into it, the, it, it's a hackney word, but multifaceted really does explain what was going on. And there's this kind of energy that is just, you know, um, you know, uh, year after year after year, it's like, I, I have this feeling, it's like, Let's do that, and then yeah, oh yeah. Well, let's do that too. We right. can do that too, right. and and who wants to do this, and who can we get to do this and that, and bring it all together in a way that is really. I mean, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable yeah. uh, kind of cultural creation that that was going on at that moment, and and actually, you know, is still obviously extremely influential. Um, and so the next slide, please. And then this would be the last one we'll talk about. Um, and this was we we got these at the at the same time, right. and uh, I think it it has a lot of the same qualities that you were talking about before. What I of course love about it as a curator is the formal aspect of it, um, and the way that uh, there's there obviously is a comfort level here with the photographer and the model, and uh, in contrast to the previous picture where the model is looking away, this one's looking at you, um, which uh, actually is kind of a theme going on, I think uh, back and forth in all of the images that, we're, that we've collected so far. Um, can you talk about this image? Yeah, you know, I, I, I love this image for so many reasons, but I think, <clears throat> you know, capturing the texture, 
um, of the fabric, right? This mm -hmm. beautiful kind of green line that comes through. Um, this one, you know, it, it has touches of the Pan-African kind of red, black, and green in it too, uh, which is really, um, which, which, which also resonates for me. But I think when you look at um, just, you know, she's, she's, a, she's a beautiful person, Ethel Parks. But the, the other thing that's really amazing about it is that it is, it's a knowing look. Right, it's this right. There's a there's a level of comfort, but I feel like she knows something, and she's communicating that she knows something to the viewer um, as she looks into the camera. And it's not quite a smile. It's not quite. It's not a smirk. But there's this, there's just it, this this thought of knowing. Um, and I think, again, even to touch upon that that comfort, right? Uh, you know, oftentimes you look at. Uh, images and there's this conversation about, you know, the white gaze versus, you know, whether or not, why are you, why are you making these images and, and, and who is it for? Um, and I think it's really amazing to see this is, you know, the photographer is, 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 a, is a black man. So he, there's this, there's this, there's a connection that's made because of there's, there's an inherent comfort, right? As, mm -hmm. as, Oftentimes when you go out into the world as an African-American person, when people are looking at you, and if someone gave you this look, there, 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 would, be an un, there would be an uncomfortable feel to it. I think there is, there is um, oftentimes as you look and you go in, there's this level of comfort, there's this level of space, there's this level of, um, I'm home and I can be comfortable with this person, but I also can be comfortable with my own skin, which is not something that you necessarily get to enjoy as you go into this world as a person of color. Oftentimes, um, you're oftentimes worried about that gaze and how that person is looking at you and what they might be thinking. And I think in here and in this space and often through his, throughout his work, there is this there is this place where it's like I'm home, I'm okay. It's a place where I can be comfortable and it's a place where I can be my true self. And so I think this one for me um, really touches upon that to, to to a great extent. But I I just love that. I love that it's it's she she knows something and we, we don't know what it is but she you, you might right. find out if if, uh, if you get close enough and the reason you're able to speak so wonderfully about this is that you were with your father during his career um and can you give just a little bit of, we're we're uh, I, we could talk for the next seven hours um, <laughs> right but, uh, I and we will you and i will at least. you're right right <laughs> um but um, can you talk about how, you know, you watched your father um, work? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, in, in very small portion of his career, right? But I think um, I was able to, I didn't understand it at first uh, when I was younger. Um, but I, but I, I started to get it a bit more when I was, I was his uh, assistant one year when I was 16 years old and I, and I was right. able to kind of really watch him as the creator, as the artist. And for me, that was an incredible experience because I was old enough to understand what what dedication to the craft was, right? When I was younger, he was just, he was gone a lot. And so he was always traveling, he was working, you know, um, he was, he, 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 was, he wasn't a man of many words. Um, and so when I got, older and I was able to kind of, he felt I was ready for that conversation or ready for talking about the work in a deeper way, but also passing on the ability to to, to make images myself. Because at one point, you know, I, I, I thought I might go and, and become a photographer as well. Um, it was this incredible way of watching and observing and being a part of the image making process itself. And, and for me, one of the best um, and, and most wonderful times was, was spending time in the dark room uh -huh. because you got to see what you went to go do. You went and you went to go make that image um, with, with the camera. And then there's the other part of it, which, you know, is eliminated now because you're working with digital, but I, but it, of the dark room process, which is now, you know, on the computer uh, for the most part, but the, the process of going through and putting in a developer, 
putting in the stop, like doing the test prints, making sure that the exposure is right, making sure that all those things um, are, cap are, are, are represented in the moment that you, you photograph maybe last week, maybe yesterday, maybe a few hours ago, but that time, time spending together and um, and in making that image and it's and it's where you know you bump into other photographers and see the work they were doing and um you know i it's uh it's funny because i i remember uh first time meeting da ube and him saying that he and my father would work out of that same place and uh -huh. so being able to kind of look at each other's work and be like wow that's amazing and 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 this creative community also responding to each other um but it is it's one of those things where I love that process. And oftentimes we'd be in the dark for, you know, 10, 12 hours, you know, just going through and making images. And he'd be like, hey, go put this through the dryer. And I would go do it and bring it back. And then we'd look outside and then we'd go back in. And it was this this process of the craft, the craft mm -hmm. of it, right? And burning in images, the way he would use his hands to kind of, you know, make sure that the images were right. And, and working with, you know, film that's not, correct it's it's not calibrated for our skin so it was right was um it was an incredible process and 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 now going through the archive and working with him it's i'm getting a much better sense of him as the man and the things that impacted him in his life and the things that meant so much to him um and it and it is it's it's an incredible gift that i've given myself by by uh you know taking on this project of making sure that he's legacy and is captured. Absolutely. And we're, you know, obviously everyone is so thankful for you for doing this um, with Robin, um, your wife. Yep. <clears throat> um, uh, I think the next slide, uh, so that ends our collection. And I, I, I should say the last two uh, photographs, the two portraits in car were on view in an exhibition we did of uh, uh, recent acquisitions, gifts and acquisitions of color photography. And what you were saying about this image in particular of Ethel Parks is absolutely true. It was just uh, riveting. Well, both were riveting in the gallery, but uh, to see them next to each other was just, it was really, it did everything that you just described right. in a way that was really quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, the next slide, please. And this, um, we'll get to the end now. Um, and hopefully be able to um, uh, take a few questions. Elena, sorry, I'm not doing the slides because I can't <laughs> think and do tech stuff at the same time. Uh, in any case, what we're going to do is um, <clears throat> uh, the, the show, um, Black is Beautiful, the photography of Kwame, Kwame Brathwaite is ongoing. Um, and uh, it will be at various um, uh, venues in the future. And it has been, there we are, this skirball uh, where I saw it in Los Angeles. And then it was at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, uh, Columbia Museum of Art um, this past summer and fall. It is next June at the Blanton at UT Austin and the Ronaldo House in Winston-Salem and then the New York Historical Society in New York, which will be very fun, I'm sure, for all yeah. involved yeah. Uh, to have it to have it there. Um, so if anyone is able to go see it, I highly recommend it. It is uh, beautifully curated and the installation at the Skirball was, was very, very beautiful. I wanted to mention the next slide that for more information, you can go to Philip Martin Gallery. This is um, their website and the artist page. And on the left here are two recently released images. And uh, the, the one on of Clara Lewis Bugs with Yellow Flower is of the same kind of genre um, of the last two that we talked about in those portraits. A marvelous study in uh, figure, ground, color, pose, everything. And then the other one, Miles Davis with uh, speed Speedbag at Harry Wiley's training gym. And that's a whole nother kind of chapter of, uh, you know, history that your father was capturing at this moment that we don't have time to go into. Um, but uh, uh, this, the, the 
artists um, pages on Philip Martin Gallery's website is really quite wonderful. And Philip's been, and his staff have been marvelous in being able to acquire this many works at so uh, uh, quick a clip. And then again, just to, in the next slide, please, um, for much, much, much more information and wonderful images, et cetera, here is the uh, screen cap of the, um, of the uh, uh, Kwame Brathwaite.com, the archive that Kwame Samori Brathwaite is in charge of. Um, there's much more to discover. And so that is what I'm intrigued by is, this has been a relatively um, recent phenomenon. Is that correct? Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, you know we started this in 20, um, 2014 technically with, with um, working through um, pulling and scanning and, and, and archiving work. And then around 2016, we had the first <clears throat> his first um, show in LA at Philip Martin Gallery, which was um, then uh, Terry and Martin. But um, it was the, the first show that we'd had uh, on the on the West Coast. And so at the time, you know, many people didn't know the work. And so it was it's been this, you know, labor of love. Uh, where we are pulling together and, and making sure that the images, one, are preserved, uh, but also uh, put out into the world uh, in, in a thoughtful way. Um, and I think uh, as we continue to go through and scan images and, and make sure that we preserve them in the right way, uh, it's, it's a critical part of, of the work that we're doing, uh, one, from an educational standpoint. But the, the beauty of it is I've you know, we're able to share the work in multi different, um, you know, different mediums, uh, whether it be the book or the the traveling show and other kind of other shows that we've done exhibitions, whether they be group exhibitions or a couple of solo ones, but also in uh, putting out work and, in, in, you know, multimedia kind of projects, uh, putting together like <clears throat> works inspired by working with um, current musicians to um, look at work and, and, and then, and then create music that, that is the soundtrack to it. Uh, and I think that's been an incredible process as well, but I think uh, one of the things that's been a major part of what we were looking to do was, um, to create a foundation. The Kwame Brathwaite Archive is a 501c3, which, uh, is in the process and should be done shortly. Um, that enables us to really kind of, um, ensure that the work is preserved, um, to do more educational programming. Uh, not just Zoom talks about the art, but but educational programming about what um, this legacy is um, from the standpoint of his work, and also kind of delve a little bit more into uh, my my father's work as a multimedia artist, um, uh, both in writing um, and, and image making, uh, and also um, to then create more opportunities for younger artists. Um, that are inspired by his work. And so I think uh, it's it's been important for me to continue along this journey and make sure that the work is preserved, uh, especially, you know, he's still with us and I want him to enjoy as much of this as possible um, because there are opportunities that are available now that they were never made available to him when he was when he was actually uh, working through and doing this work. So it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. I think that that's, what I was talking about before about the idea of it not being nostalgic <clears throat> and that there is a relevancy to, you know, today. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, look, there's, um, there, there, there is, you know, there's, it's okay to be nostalgic to some extent in that you, you look back to kind sure. of help you direct your future. Right. Uh, I think one of the things that's happened, especially now uh, in such tumultuous times, is that people have been looking at the work um, as inspiration, right? Uh -huh. To get these positive images, to get these images that make them, that kind of feed your soul um, to some extent uh, back into your life, but also to inspire. Uh, you know, there have been, you know, multiple artists who now collected the work who are, you know, it's, it's, it's informing the way in which they kind of move into their own work now and, and visualize uh, conceptually what they're doing. And, and it's been really amazing to see. Um, but it's also, um, I think it's important as you look at the movement itself and what, um, what it was made to do was made to 
help people understand that um, the there is not equity, right? There's not equity for for people from different backgrounds. And I think um, as we push forward and continue to to fight for that equity, for that equality, for fair treatment. Um, that this work still resonates, right? It's mm -hmm. still relevant. Uh, and, and I think the difference between what was happening in the 60s when this was all <clears throat> really at peak um, until now is that you, you, you have a means to communicate more quickly and globally um, information which you didn't have before. And so I think this, this global phenomenon that's, that's been this call to action um, is certainly uh, still relevant in his work and feels that. And that gets back to this idea of using the technology of today to create these images in a way that are, they are able to be distributed and seen both in a kind of, uh, you know, fine art museum context, but also <clears throat> in the manner that you were just talking about this, this, you know, internationally available means of communication. Sure. And so I think that, you know, the creation of these works now it's like they're almost new works of art in and of themselves even though you know because you're using the technologies of today from information that was created a long time ago sure and that that to me is is uh you know marvelous uh in in the way that it can move as you said on in so many different um channels on so right. many different uh avenues which is great Okay, so it's already, oh my gosh, it's 12.15. Um, so why don't we take just a few questions and uh, uh, we'll see. We have one. Uh, a question from Tom says, you touched on meeting other photographers. Did your father have a chance to work with Roy DeCarava or meet him photographing jazz clubs? Also, Gene Smith was in NYC photographing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, um, sorry, my, my thing. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. My okay, thing, right. No, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, he, you know, they, they interacted, the photographers knew each other. And I, I think it's really, um, um, I know that they uh, interacted. I don't know that they particularly did, um, you know, collaborate on anything, but I do know uh, he knew Roy, he knew Gordon Parks, he knew, you know, it, it was a, it was a, it's a small community right, of um, active uh, image makers that uh, all respected each other's work and worked together. I think um, even in one, when, when I talked to, um, we did a talk at MOAD, uh, Deb Willis shared, you know, that was part of the reason um, she was she was eager to, to work with us on the book is that when she first, you know, was starting out as a photographer, she went to speak to him and he was so encouraging and so inviting. And I think um, as, as a community, uh, and I found this as well, being, you know, someone who works in commercial real estate, you know, for my day job, who's, who's out, you know, looking for real estate. Um, when I started to venture in and, and understand this art world, um, how much of a community it really is uh, and how much um, people are willing to share information, people are willing to um, continue to work together and, 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 and be creators um, in a collaborative way um, that that all did exist. And so, yeah, I, I, I know he knew. I don't know uh, specifically if there were any collaborations, though. Um, the next question is, could you speak more about or expand on technical adjustments you had to make in the darkroom to adjust for the fact that film was not designed for dark skin? So, you know, um, one of the things that's in, in, you know, every every person of color has experienced this where you may be sitting in a room where there's natural light or there's light, but the light, the, where the light source is can certainly impact the way in which um, that image uh, is, is brought about. So on film specifically, if the light source isn't, isn't balanced properly, um, you will, you'll have difficulty capturing the true tone of someone's skin. Uh, and in the dark room, uh, part of that process is obviously understanding what the right exposure time is, but also um, in the process of using the enlarger, um, creating spaces where you block off the light uh, for the surrounding area, but then on the skin tone of the person, you might have to burn in 
to, to, to a great extent. And that was one of the processes that I loved watching him um, go through because it is, it's a very specific one and his use of either, you know, whether it be his hands or, um, you know, specific um, other, other cutouts of, of, of images that he printed previously to create, you know, a box or a square or a circle, what have you, um, to ensure that the image was properly exposed, um, but that it didn't get blown out in the background because of the because of the exposure that you put on put put on the image. Um, and then the same person says, "Not a question." Saw the exhibition at Moad, absolutely breathtaking, uh, which is wonderful. So. Um, what I would like to just close on is to say thank you, Kwame, so much, and also uh, to let people know that um, the book is on sale at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art Bookstore uh, for those of us who are in the region, and also that we are uh, opening our new museum in uh, galleries in the spring. And that self-portrait is going to be part of an exhibition of uh, portrait portraiture from the collection called Facing Forward, uh, portraits uh, from the collection. And um, I'm, I'm excited because I haven't shown it yet at the museum. Uh, I've been saving these, these works uh, to show it at certain times, but um, I'm very excited to see that work up in our galleries. And I hope that everyone can be able to come and um, enjoy. We are, we are aiming for the spring. And the other thing I want uh, to say is to thank Elena Hancock and Fabian Leva Barragan, my colleagues who worked here uh, so much or so diligently to make this happen. And this was fantastic, Kwame. I, I just really, I learned a lot myself um, and I can't wait for this pandemic to be over um, so we can visit in person more. Mm -hmm. um, we sure. did have a chance at the gallery, but it was way distanced <laughs> yeah. and with masks and the whole thing. Um, but uh, I look forward to having many, many more conversations with you and Robin as well. Yeah, yeah so, no, thank you. I, I think, um, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's always amazing uh, opportunity to be able to share this work and, and the work that AJAZ and the Grand Ass and Models were doing. Uh, I think um, it's, it's, uh, if, if you want to know more, obviously, as Charlie mentioned, come to the website. Um, if you are a collector, um, please reach out to Philip Martin Gallery. And I think um, one thing that's uh, on the on the horizon that will happen in the next couple of weeks is that we are going to be re-releasing the, um, the Black is Beautiful poster um, in conjunction with Bob Gums, uh, who I think is on the call. Um, so that, that'll be exciting. It's the 50th anniversary of that. Um, collaboration of Bob, who's an AJAS member and graphic artist and, and writer um, with my father uh, to put out that really iconic poster um, from 1970. Mm. So that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's really, um, thank you for, for, for giving me the opportunity to spend time with you uh, in front of the audience. Uh, and I look forward to spending more time with you uh, in the future. Absolutely. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, stay tuned to SBMA for more great talks. And Kwame, have a, have a wonderful Sunday. And you thank too. you again. All right. Take okay. care. Take care.